Yu-Gi-Oh! is dying! It's something you've probably heard quite a lot lately. As someone as old as I am, I've heard it probably 50 times throughout the last 20 years as playing this game. If anything, I consider it a sign of the opposite, that the designers have done a good enough job lately that I only hear that like once a year now, and we used to hear it every three to six months. The last time was probably tier limit format. People were convinced that this was the end of Yu-Gi-Oh! Sure enough, here we are a couple years later, tier limits are still somewhat around. Tournament attendance has never been higher. We had an 8,000 player tournament over in Japan just a couple months ago, and YCSs are still breaking records even after the pandemic took them away from us for two years. So why do you think people feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! is dying? A big reason is tournament attendance at the local level goes down when there's not enough variety. A big part of that is something we're going to talk about today. A new kind of design direction that really took hold starting in 2020 and has become just about omnipresent in the format since. Today we're going to talk about autocorrect cards. If we rewind to the year 2012, we have what we called Insector Format. No, no we, we didn't. didn't. We, we called, called it like, like Dino, Dino Rabbit, Rabbit Format. format. We, we should have, have called it Insector Format, format. blah, blah, blah. Okay. If we rewind to 2012, some of you may remember two crazy decks, Windups and Insectors. But the deck that definitely did a lot more damage, including winning the World Championship, was the Insector deck. It had something like Dragonfly that special summoned from the deck, Insector Centipede that added from the deck to the hand, and several other effects that most archetypes have gone on to emulate since. But up until that point, both of those effects were pretty rare. You'd have one or the other, typically neither in a typical archetype, and Insectors were given all of that because it was supposed to be somewhat difficult to proc their effects. Unfortunately, it was so much easier than expected and so consistent, it's more or less why everything is hard once per turn now, over 10 years later. None of the Insector cards were once per turn. Since then, similar kinds of design concepts have been inspired by the occasional archetype to create a similar card in other decks. Another example of this would be something like Altergeist Protocol emulating the effect of Miscellaneousaurus. There definitely is an interest both in the player base and in the designers of having effects that you recognize and are familiar with so that you can know how to pilot your deck a little easier or play against someone else's deck when it's doing something similar. As this kind of philosophy has grown more and more, it has gotten less and less diverse as new archetypes come out and replace the ones before them. Each time a new set drops, we get one to four new decks. They start to just feel more and more familiar as they're just carbon copies of a deck that came before. One such example was Marincess being the exact same deck as Salamangrate, and Salamangrate when it was brand new, a lot of people were just referring to all the cards in it as the cards they were based on, like Pot of Duality or Armageddon Knight. It seemed like every card in the Salamangrate deck was just another past Yu-Gi-Oh card in disguise as a little fire mammal of some kind. Uh, Windups won the NAWCQ that year, but Insectors won Worlds and everything else. You, you can, can call, call it Windup wind up format, format if you want, but Windups didn't, didn't really do too much, much compared to, to like Shockmaster Windup wind format, format, which came later. later. In pursuit of this kind of card design philosophy, Konami came up with the search effect. Every deck seemed to have. It used to be on things like Stratos, where you had to normal summon your monster to search your deck, but they started to add that to things like field spells. And after enough copies of Spiral Resort and Magical Meltdown hit the board, it seemed like enough was enough, and even cards like Terraforming were finding themselves on the Forbidden and Limited list. Continuing forward from that, though, a step was taken to sort of circumvent power creep that these kind of effects were having. When you have something like Zodiac Broadbull or Magical Meltdown just giving you a plus one when searching, it's a little powerful. With the rise of consistency thanks to Link Monsters, 
more and more decks were finding themselves unable to compete unless they too were just overwhelmingly consistent. We went from having three copies of our card to having six because of a searcher to suddenly having searchers for our searchers. It wasn't enough to just have something like Satellar Knight Deneb to search for our Zephra scales. We also needed reinforcement of the army to get Satellar Knight Deneb. It wasn't enough to have Necroz of Bryanak to search for Shuret. We needed Preparation of Rites to search for Bryanak and we needed Manju to search for Bryanak. In light of this, due to the consistency of even the search cards, the plus was coming too easily. And when you had Barrage to search for Zodiac Rat Peer and that was getting Broad Bull, it was too much consistency and things like Broad Bull had to get banned. Things like Terraforming and Rota had to go to one. In light of this, the card Virtual World Gate Chinglong was given a discard as part of its search effect. It wasn't enough that you could add one virtual world card from your deck to your hand. You then had to send one card from your hand to the graveyard. This was done because access to Chinglong was itself something super accessible. Just generating a plus one, like most of the things before it, would be considerably too strong. There's no one who was there in 2020 who won't tell you Virtual World was the best deck in the entire game and that its combos were far too consistent. And that was with this thing and several other cards in that deck discarding a card. We literally played Stardust Charge Warrior just to draw one. This is what I would consider, if not the first autocorrect card, the first prevalent autocorrect card, and one that led to the biggest problem with the current Yu-Gi-Oh meta. So what do I mean by an autocorrect card? Put most simply, an autocorrect card is a card that trades the worst card in your hand for the best card in your deck. Typically, your correction cards are not something that's built into your combo, but due to the nature of searchers being searched, the searcher cards now have this discard on them. What this fundamentally means is that every time you go through the virtual world combo, you're going to discard a card. And that is, in a vacuum, a good thing. It keeps a deck that consistent and that powerful reined in ever so slightly. Unfortunately, it also removes a lot of the diversity in both deck building and playing, and worst of all, in the skill gap. If we fast forward a couple of years, we can get to another pretty omnipresent autocorrect card, Lubellion the Searing Dragon. Every time you played Branded Fusion, you would send your Dark Monster, your Fallen of Albaz, and you would summon this card so that it could shuffle itself and Albaz back to summon Mirror Jade. It wasn't enough for Branded Fusion to just summon Mirror Jade directly. We had to have this extra card in the way to both occupy an extra deck slot and make you discard a card from your hand because Branded Fusion was dumping Despian Tragedy and that was going to search your deck for a card. It's not quite identical to Chinglong, but the result is the same. We discarded the worst card in our hand and added the best card in our deck to our hand. And that ultimately is what an autocorrect card is. This kind of design would slowly become more common over the years, with things like every single runic spell getting Hugin the runic wings, and things like Pearly Happy Memory here, discarding a card to access the Pearly from its deck. Every time these decks are played, every single runic spell is just going to get Hugin, discard a card in your hand, and search your deck for Runic Fountain and add it to your hand taking the worst card in your hand and turning it into the best card in your deck. In a vacuum, all this consistency coming with all this cost sounds like it's doing a good job of trading power for consistency, because with this rate of consistency increase, you're lowering the ceiling of the decks by taking a card out of their hand. Unfortunately, this has a terrible side effect that I'm not sure Konami did on purpose, which is that in mere matches between these decks, deck building mistakes get punished significantly less. What do I mean by this? Well, let's take a look at the Tenpai deck. I have in here a typical Tenpai hand with a pair of hand traps in it. And both of these are hard ones per turn. They should not be functional. I can use one Ash, I can't use the other. However, during the combo, Tenpai Dragon Pydra would add Sangen Summoning, which searches my deck and discards a card. With this hand, I can discard the extra Ash. I'd honestly probably still discard maybe the second Fenrir, but the point is, because I built my deck suboptimally and have this brick in it, the field spell is going to allow me to just discard that anyway. 
if instead my hand had a card such as Ghost Bell in it, where the two hard ones for turn effects do not clash with each other. Instead of being rewarded for having the foresight to mix up my hard ones per turn effects a little bit, or play slightly stronger cards, I'm instead punished subtly in that I have to discard the Ash or the Bell. And my opponent, who had the terrible version of the Tenpai deck here with the two Ashes in it, can just discard his second Ash, and we both end up with the exact same result. So rather than my opponent consistency being punished for making a mistake, he is given the same end result that I am when I didn't make that mistake. This simultaneously reduces the variance in duels, where both of us are going to have the exact same end board even though we have two different hands, as well as raising the skill floor on the deck artificially because he doesn't have to make that decision, he doesn't have to deck build as effectively to go as far with a deck. And in doing so, Part of the skill ceiling has been removed, and part of the skill floor has been raised up. So win rates that used to be, say, 60 and 70% are now both 65. And with that erasure of the skill gap, better players are being defeated more often by inferior players. And that's very demoralizing in a tournament setting. It's something that typically should only happen in something like a Sword Soul Mirror or a Virtual World Mirror, where there's so much else going on and mirror matches have so much more dynamics to them that you don't really notice or feel it. And this would only really be a problem if it was every deck in the game. And that brings us to the current format, where you have cards like Diabella Star the Black Witch trading any card in your hand for original Sinful Spoils to get whether it was Ponyx of the Fire King or Rescue Ace Hydrant or just Snake Eye Ash, and you have Nightmare Pain in the Ubel combos, and you have obviously Sangen Summoning in the Tempai deck, or Walls of the Imperial Tomb, and even though we've had, for years and years, we've had cards like Ancient Gear Frame or Apprentice Illusion Magician, Dragonic Diagram, uh, very recently something like Dark Corridor, which just happens to be this because that's how Dark Worlds work. Uh, the unsearchable ones, like Lunalite Perfume, that were just kind of correction cards that could still effectively boost your consistency and give you that card in your deck that you need to keep up at the cost of the worst card in your hand, these kinds of correction cards are now autocorrect cards in that they are part of the very combo of the deck you're playing. Something like Imcity in the Horus deck cleanses itself for the King's Sarcophagus while also just cycling a card in your hand. And then King's Sarcophagus lets you trade any card in your hand for another level 8 body. When every single deck has an autocorrect card in its combo, it means we're effectively all playing with a four card hand, and the worst card in our hand, no matter which deck we're playing, is just going to get discarded. So playing things like a second copy of Gem Knight Garnet will no longer be as punishing compared to when we used to have five, six cards in our opening hands to actually play with. We now have four, and so do our opponents. So instead of just kind of stopping our deck from being too powerful in light of its consistency, we've also stopped our opponents from bricking in scenarios where we wouldn't have. And that has erased a lot of the deck building advantage and diversity. It's no secret that with Link Monsters being generic and a mechanic not requiring something like a tuner or a specific level, every deck has access to things like Appaloosa or Fibrax. And so the vast majority of decks were going down pretty similar, if not identical combo lines. Nowadays, a lot of deck main decks focuses are just get the guys on the field to make a typical starter play. And it's been somewhat refreshing, honestly, to see something like Snake Eye Ash that gets Flame Burge Dragon and actually just interacts with its own deck and cards instead of the same link monsters every deck did before it. When you have these big engines like Wanted and Diabellstar, 
and you have these autocorrect cards like Sangin Summoning where your searchers need searchers and instead of having three copies of something you have nine. It very quickly adds up to close to 30 if not all 40 cards in a deck only for that deck to then also be making the same boards and when there's only four card hands and less variants all that consistency turns into just copy pasting combos out of spreadsheets and it doesn't matter which deck you're on you're just trying to still make as many negates as you can going first and hand trapping the deck in the spots that makes the most sense so that it can't do that and then you're just trying to do the same thing back to them just with a different coat of paint on it it's gone from decks feeling similar to decks being genuinely similar with the same end boards and the same duels happening over and over again and a big reason why these duels keep repeating themselves is that there is only one to three cards that you're trying to play you're given nine copies of each one and the other couple of cards in your hand that would lead to some sort of variance have gone from being something like maybe a Solemn Judgment or a Tech Sanctum to get Scythe and a Salaman Great deck to just something you've discarded to the graveyard to resolve the effects of one of your consistency cards to do the same thing you did the round before that you will do again the round after. And it's that low level of variance that has made formats feel solved so quickly and made things feel stale so fast and made people clamor for ban lists, new set releases, imports of this, that, and the other, or trying out other games just to have something resembling diversity. I don't think that this is necessarily something Konami has done deliberately. I personally believe that it is a byproduct of them trying to just balance the high levels of consistency that their cards have gotten but it has gotten to a point now where we need the pluses rather than the discards so that there's something resembling variance between the two players and the multiple duels that they're going to have and that the people making these glaring deck building mistakes with way too many hard once per turn playsets in their deck or multiple copies of engine requirement cards like bricks and garnets that they go back to not performing as well as the people who are building their decks if not properly then at least more efficiently and more effectively what we need is a return to variance in opening hands and preferably a bit of variance in end boards even if it's something as simple as the horus deck having a horus rank 8 with an omni negate on it and the branded deck having a branded fusion monster with an omni decade on it instead of both of them just making baron de fleur i would still take like six or seven different omni bosses that have different holes in their armor one of them can't be targeted and the other can but one of them can't be destroyed and the other can um just bringing back some kind of variety to the kinds of end boards that we get and the kinds of opening hands that we see because it, it's gotten to the point that voiceless voice is the only deck that doesn't have something like blessings making you discard a card and that's again because the ritual decks need to have these like crazy three card combos to resolve a ritual summon in the first place looking forward we have the set rage of the abyss releasing in the tcg this coming october and that has an archetype like the primordials we know that the card we're currently calling Tremors special summons a vanilla from your deck and rather than putting it in my hand and making me discard a card it's putting it on the board and the Imperial Dragon is asking me to tribute it to summon him and that at the very least is keeping the cards in my hand in my hand this is a direction that I like to see and all the different kinds of decks like Phantasm Spiral to Blue Eyes White Dragon to just an anti-meta deck based around Doku Royaiba <laughs> gives me a lot of hope for the future. I think it would be super cool, for example, to use this to get Blue Eyes White Dragon alongside with things like Dragon Shine that can dump him and or Blue Eyes Jet Dragon. They just reprinted Blue Eyes Jet and Spirit in Rarity Collection 2, and I think a big reason for it is that they knew people were going to want access to it for stuff like this. 
Blue Eyes Jet Dragon can go in any deck, and it's a really, really sticky card that is great at clearing boards and inflicting a ton of damage. When you have something like Tremors to access Blue Eyes White Dragon, it becomes a very splashable engine in things. When you have design that's going from deck to field, which does feel like a natural progression for power creep, it's not cleansing your hand as long as it also gets the card off the field. A recent-ish example would be like Emergency. If this card did not say from your hand or field and was just from your field, this would be perfect. This kind of increase to consistency in the decks that doesn't allow you to just discard the accidental brick that you drew and instead would suggest you can use it as Foolish Burial by summoning and then tributing the guy the way everyone uses Telemann's Grief. You could normal summon the fire attacker in your hand to then still use this and get Hydrant and tribute the fire attacker. That would stop you from getting rid of those extra Ash Blossoms or that Dark Magician you drew in your Dragoon package and actually go back to making deck building matter. When you can just net deck someone and emulate the same results as them, there's no reason to innovate. Cards like Emergency and Primordial Tremors are a great step in the right direction, so hopefully Konami makes more of these. Overall, I don't think Yu-Gi-Oh! is going to die. I don't think that attendance will continue to suffer at the highest levels of the game, but it's getting to the point that people don't want to go to locals just so that they can see Kashtira Arise Heart again, so that they can see Snake Eyes Flame Bridge Dragon again, and ban lists can continue to be band-aids on this problem, but it needs to be reined in at the point of design for the archetypes before this problem can get better. And if it's going to continue to go from one or two decks to every single deck they make, then sooner or later, Yu-Gi-Oh! is just going to be reduced to comparing opening hands, and nobody wants that. Now, I could be crazy, Maybe you have a different idea, and you can let me know down in the comments. I'm also interested to see what kind of other autocorrect cards did I maybe not talk about that you found in your own deck. I'm going to be reading the comments looking for those, as well as any other ideas that maybe you guys have that could fix this problem with current Yu-Gi-Oh. You can find more at yugipedia.com, my other website yugioorganization.com, or just joining either of those Discord servers. Please remember to comment and subscribe. Don't, Don't really, really care, care if you, you liked it, it. You, you watched, watched it this long, long. and I'll see you on the next video.